Hi, I'm Jennifer Ho, and I work for the HUD Secretary, Julian Castro. You're invited here today to learn about an exciting new federal partnership to help folks get access to affordable health insurance and affordable care. With me today, I am very thrilled to have federal partners from within HUD, from the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness, and from various parts of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Specifically with me, Anne Marie Oliva is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Special Needs um, here at HUD. Richard Cho is a Senior Policy Director at the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness, and one of Richard's key areas has been to focus on the connection between housing and health care and then Dr. Seiji Hayashi is the Chief Medical Officer in the Bureau of Primary Health Care at the Health Resources and Services Administration. As Chief Medical Officer, uh, Dr. Hayashi oversees the Bureau's clinical quality strategy for the nation's community health centers. Jamie Marshall is here as the Chief of the Homeless Services Branch at the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. And joining me later will be Donna Cohen-Ross from the Center on Medicaid and CHIP Services She's the Director of Enrollment Initiatives tied to Medicaid. And Emily Rosanoff is in the HHS Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation in the Office of Disability, Aging, and Long-Term Care Policy. Emily is most recently responsible for the release of two important documents, a primer on using Medicaid for people experiencing chronic homelessness and tenants of permanent supportive housing, and a companion document, Medicaid and Permanent Supportive Housing for Chronically Homeless Individuals, Emerging Practices from the Field. Thank you, everybody, for joining me here today. I'm so excited that this federal partnership is helping um, us think together about how to make sure that people who are living in HUD-assisted housing have an opportunity to get enrolled in, in health insurance and get better access to care. As you may well know, November 15th marked the opening of the second open enrollment period under the Affordable Care Act. During this open enrollment period, millions of people are able to research and identify appropriate and affordable health insurance for themselves and for their families. Many residents in HUD-assisted housing, including those living in HUD's homeless continuum of care housing and housing under housing opportunities for persons with AIDS, Access to health insurance, including Medicaid, is the critical step that they need to access health care. The strong link between housing and health care cannot be overstated. The U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, working with our partners at the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, has launched a targeted technical assistance initiative to work with COC and HOPWA-funded housing providers to help residents access available health insurance and quality health care services. This collaboration among the federal agencies will bring together the needed planning resources, information, and tools to allow residents of HUD-funded housing to obtain quality health care in their communities. This initiative, which we're calling H-squared, uh, reflects the connectedness of housing and health care. And it starts this month with this Federal Partners webinar outlining the opportunities available by these Federal Partners and their grantees to improve health, health outcomes for those living in HUD housing. Today's webinar will be followed by a series of webinars focused on key components of access to health care, including enrollment in Medicaid and other insurance, peer strategies to advocate for increased access to health care, and other specific strategy discussions for COCs in states that have not yet chosen to expand access to Medicaid. In addition to the webinars, HUD, with support from our federal partners, is providing direct technical assistance to COC communities to conduct hands-on planning in their communities on locally identified issues related to increasing access to insurance and health care. On December 10th, HUD TA providers work with COC recipients, HOPWA grantees, local health care providers, and Medicaid officials in Nevada to develop an action plan to help transition people leaving acute care facilities back into the community and to expand partnerships with managed care providers in the state. One additional action planning session is scheduled to take place in January in Virginia. Several other COCs responded to HUD's request for uh, with an interest to receive housing and health care systems integration action planning TA in their communities. The initial list of sites being, is being finalized right now, but HUD encourages COCs that are interested in this technical assistance to submit a request. Information on how to submit a request will be provided at the end of this webinar. So, 
This is a fantastic opportunity, and Anne, I'm so glad that you're with us here today. What do you have? All right, thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, hello to our Continuum of Care Emergency Solutions Grants and HOPWA uh, recipients, Continuum of Care leadership, and other community stakeholders who are watching this broadcast today. Again, my name is Anne Oliva. I am the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Special Needs, and in that capacity, I oversee both the Office of HIV AIDS Housing that runs the HOPWA program and the Office of Special Needs Assistance Programs that runs HUD's homeless programs. And I'm pleased to be participating today because I see this initiative, uh, the one that Jennifer described, as a potential game changer in the field. It's an opportunity to pair mainstream services and systems with the homeless and homelessness prevention systems in a meaningful way that brings resources to the people we serve and the programs uh, that serve them in the community. The programs in my purview here at HUD serve some of the nation's most vulnerable families and individuals, those that are experiencing or are at risk of homelessness. People experiencing homelessness disproportionately have multiple chronic health conditions, including mental health and substance use disorders, and medical conditions when compared to the total population. Those living with HIV or AIDS face a, multi a multitude of other life challenges. The opportunities that exist in the intersection between these homeless and housing networks and healthcare systems are extremely important, not only to accomplish our mission of preventing and ending homelessness, but also to the missions of our federal partners at HHS, whose programs target the same populations that we serve. I therefore want to encourage our viewers today to participate in the upcoming webinars and broadcasts that will follow this initial federal partners webinar. And as we move forward with this initiative, you'll see that today's session is just the first part of our continuing effort uh, to increase access by continuums of care and HOPWA grantees uh, and their program participants to mainstream resources, including Medicaid. As our budget environment tightens, it is imperative that we find ways to maximize the funding we do have at both the federal and local levels. In our most recent grants competition for homeless programs, HUD spent over $437 million, or 26% of the funds that we awarded, on services for our program participants. These are critical services, but many of them could be made available through mainstream systems and therefore free up funding for additional housing opportunities. We also know that many of our continuums of care are not formally connected to systems um, that are put in place through the impl implementation of the Affordable Care Act or other mainstream systems. Through this initiative, we're working to develop and implement a multi-prong approach with a key element being on the ground action planning sessions that Jennifer mentioned um, to provide meaningful assistance to COC communities and to bridge the gaps that they identify at the local level. And of course, we are working closely with our federal partners who are on the panel with me today, and I look forward to the rest of the discussion. Back to you, Jennifer. Great, thanks, Anne, and I really wanna thank you and your team for your leadership on this issue, making these critical connections to health insurance and healthcare really for the people important. your programs serve. Thank you. So next, I wanna turn it over to Richard Cho at the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness. Richard, welcome. Thank you, Jennifer. The Interagency Council is very excited to be a part of this initiative, and we want to thank our partners at HUD and HHS for putting this together. I want to talk today a little bit about the intersection between healthcare and housing, uh, and as, as Anne mentioned, uh, explain why I think it is a game changer for our effort to end homelessness. The intersection between healthcare and housing uh, has been well documented in the research. Uh, there are studies that show the impact that housing has uh, in terms of the environment that it creates for people and the health impacts that it has on, on people who live in housing. It also talks about uh, residential mobility and the impact that that can have negatively on people's ability to have uh, continuous care. Uh, and research has also documented the relationship that homelessness has on negative health outcomes and the degree to which chronic health conditions can also exacerbate and, and contribute to homelessness. Uh, and more recent research has looked at the intersection between homelessness uh, and high cost utilization of Medicaid services, in particular looking at a subset of, of individuals who really drive up Medicaid costs. Uh, th there's been a number of studies now that have shown that people experiencing chronic homelessness uh, uh, tend to use uh, emergency rooms and inpatient hospitalizations to a higher degree, uh, also contributing to higher Medicaid costs, uh, and that uh, with, among uh, subsets of individuals who are healthcare super utilizers, uh, there's a higher prevalence of people experiencing homelessness. Some studies have found that homelessness prevalence among healthcare super, super utilizers is as much as 42%. And many studies have also shown that the experience of chronic homelessness can also drive up public costs, uh, with the Medicaid costs of people experiencing chronic homelessness being as high as $5,000 to $6,000 uh, on a per person per month basis. 
a lot of that has really driven uh, states uh, and healthcare systems to start to think about housing as a, as a healthcare solution. Uh, these are just two quotes that show that uh, from the healthcare system, people are beginning to think about housing as a way to really improve healthcare outcomes and to understand housing and in particular supportive housing as a way to really achieve healthcare outcomes as well. The evidence of permanent supportive housing's impact on health has been really well documented. There have been studies that show that supportive housing has, is associated with improved health care outcomes as well as behavioral health outcomes, uh, including reductions in alcohol use, improvements in mental health outcomes, um, and reductions in other substance use. Uh, and some studies have even shown that uh, for people who are living with HIV and AIDS, placement into supportive housing uh, can result in higher survival rates as well as lower T cell counts. There's also been studies that have shown that permanent supportive housing has impacts on health care costs as well, uh, reducing people's utilization of emergency rooms, inpatient hospitalizations, detox, and other costly uh, health care services, uh, translating to reductions in, in Medicaid costs overall. Uh, I, th I think it's a really compelling intersection between health care and housing uh, that's really informed the federal strategic plan to prevent and end homelessness, otherwise known as opening doors. The intersection between health care and housing uh, is found in no a number of places throughout the federal plan. Uh, including, uh, in particular, in the fourth theme, which is known as uh, improving health and stability. While the intersection between healthcare and housing is found in a number of places in opening doors, there are two places in particular where you can find this intersection uh, most prominently. The first is in Objective 7, uh, the objective which is around integrating healthcare with housing, uh, and where uh, that, that particular objective calls for the integration of healthcare with housing uh, as a way to help people experiencing homelessness uh, achieve better health as well as um, reduce and avoid homelessness. You also see the intersection between health and housing in Objective 4, which is about providing permanent supportive housing to end chronic homelessness, uh, where uh, uh, Opening Doors makes a strong statement that supportive housing, using Housing First, is a proven intervention that can help achieve better housing stability as well as improvements in health and well-being. And also calls out that the passage of the Affordable Care Act creates new opportunities to be able to pay for services uh, for people who live in permanent supportive housing. Now I want to talk a little bit about some of the promising strategies uh, that we're seeing in communities around how to intersect uh, and create that intersection between healthcare and housing. Uh, the first is where we're seeing uh, many more communities and states making Medicaid and healthcare uh, and health insurance enrollment a core part of their homeless services strategies. You see that in places like California, where there's been a big emphasis on integrating healthcare enrollment uh, with their homelessness assistance um, programs. Uh, and places like Baltimore, where healthcare for the homeless programs have really uh, had a concerted focus on helping people to enroll in Medicaid. Uh, in, in other communities, you're starting to see the integration of healthcare uh, and housing through the integration of housing and healthcare for the homeless and, health, health, and community health centers, uh, both in Portland, Oregon, in Los Angeles, in Louisville, Kentucky, and in many other communities around the country. Uh, community health centers and housing are both partnering as well as, in some cases, co-locating their, their programs uh, to be able to better serve people who are experiencing homelessness. Uh, in some states, uh, uh, they're beginning to match Medicaid data with homelessness management information systems to be able to identify the homelessness status among Medicaid beneficiaries, as well as to identify people who are high utilizers of Medicaid costs who are also experiencing homelessness and focusing on how we can prioritize those individuals for assistance. And you see that in, effort in states like Connecticut and Washington. Uh, states are now beginning to also look at how to uh, design Medicaid benefits that can uh, co cover services for people in permanent supportive housing. Uh, Louisiana and Massachusetts are two states that have really um, been leaders in that effort. Uh, and last but not least, um, we're beginning to now see uh, how uh, looking at housing stability uh, and housing outcomes is becoming part of the way that states are starting to think about their healthcare strategies. Uh, in states like New York, for instance, uh, looking at housing stability has become a core outcome uh, for their um, health transformation and health reform efforts. I'm going to turn this back over to you, Jennifer. Great. Thanks, Richard. And thanks for making such a great point about the relationship between housing and health and how critical it is that we get health care to help people get off the streets, but also that good health care can help maintain people in their homes. Next, I'm going to turn to uh, Dr. Seiji Hayashi. Seiji, it's great to have you here from HRSA. And looking forward to hearing what you have to say about the role of health care for the homeless programs, but also community health centers. Welcome to HUD. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And thank you very much for the opportunity to be with you today. We are excited to be a partner with HUD and other federal agencies. For more than 45 years, health centers have delivered comprehensive, high-quality, cost-effective primary health care to patients regardless of their ability to pay. 
During that time, health centers have become the essential primary care provider for America's most vulnerable populations, including those who are experience homelessness. Health centers advance the preventive and primary health home model of coordinated, comprehensive, and patient-centered care, coordinating a wide range of medical, dental, behavioral, and social services. Today, nearly 1,300 health centers operate over 9,000 service delivery sites that provide care in every state, District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and the Pacific Basin. Nearly half of all health centers serve rural populations as well. In 2013, these community-based and patient-directed health centers served 21.7 million patients, providing almost 86 million patient visits. Some health centers also receive funding to focus on certain special populations that include individuals and families experiencing homelessness, agricultural workers and their de dependents, those living in public housing, and Native Hawaiians. For this discussion, I will briefly describe our programs that focus on two of these special populations. First, the homeless. We all know that homelessness continues to be a pervasive problem throughout the U.S., affecting rural areas as well as urban and suburban communities. Estimates of people who experience homelessness range from 1.6 million to 3.5 million each year. In 2013, HRSA-funded health centers served more than 1.1 million persons experiencing homelessness. The vast majority of this 1 million is served by the 250 Healthcare for the Homeless grantees. This means that HRSA-supported health centers that serve the homeless are an essential source of care for homeless persons across the United States. Healthcare for the Homeless grantees serve patients that live on the street, in shelters, in transitional housing, and recognize the complex needs of homeless persons and strive to provide a coordinated, comprehensive approach to healthcare, including substance abuse and mental health services. Another vulnerable population salient to our discussion here is the population that lives in public housing. We have 80 grantees that receive specific funding for a public housing primary care program. These grantees, like all of our health center program grantees, provide increased access to comprehensive primary health care services through the direct provision of health promotion, disease prevention, and primary health care services. Services are provided on the premises of public housing developments or at other locations immediately accessible to residents. In 2013, HRSA-funded health centers served over 220,000 residents of public housing. As we all know, lack of housing and poverty are associated with poor health. Poverty and homelessness are often caused by illness, and being homeless makes these illnesses worse. That's why our partnership with HUD is so important. I also want to briefly mention some of our activities around health issues important to those that care for the homeless. Although homeless individuals suffer from many of the common chronic diseases, like heart disease and diabetes, I want to mention several other important health issues where disparities are especially large. Mental illness and addiction disproportionately impact the homeless. That's why all of our health care for the homeless grantees are required to provide substance abuse services. In order to support health care for the homeless grantees, as well as others, we awarded over $100 million to expand mental health services and integrate behavioral health care across the U.S. Additionally, HRSA awarded supplemental funding of $295 million for service expansion for behavioral health, oral health, pharmacy services, and vision services, all very essential services, especially for the homeless. It's impossible to talk about behavioral health issues in the homeless without talking about HIV and viral hepatitis. HRSA helped develop and implement the National HIV AIDS Strategy and also the HHS Viral Hepatitis Action Plan. We have been working hard to encourage and support health centers to increase testing and improve treatment. These have led to significant increases in the number of patients who receive tests for HIV and hepatitis. For example, in 2013, health centers provided HIV testing to over a million patients. This is a 38% increase from 2010. Similarly, we have dramatically increased testing for hepatitis B and also hepatitis C. To further build on our successes around HIV, HRSA is partnering with CDC on the Secretary's Minority AIDS Initiative to build sustainable partnership 
among CDC-funded state health departments and HRSA-funded health centers to support expanded HIV service, service delivery in communities highly affected by HIV. And this is especially among racial and ethnic minorities. So in summary, there are many health centers doing great work, but through partnership and collaborations like this, we can do even more. Thank you very much, Jennifer, and back to you. Seiji, thank you so much. I mean, it really, I think a lot of people who work in homeless programs are very familiar with the health care for the homeless uh, providers, and they're a critical part of providing care in the community. But it's great also to hear that the Affordable Care Act has expanded access through the health centers overall. Next, I'm going to turn to Jamie Marshall from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Jamie, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to participate in this critical discussion with our federal partners today and to speak to the continuums of care. Partnerships and collaboration are at the heart of what we do at SAMHSA and with our federal partners to help end homelessness for individuals with behavioral health conditions. Of the more than 578,000 people who were experiencing homelessness on a given night in January 2014, one in five had serious mental illness and another 20% had chronic substance abuse problems. Individuals with mental and substance use conditions are overrepresented among those who experience homelessness. They died decades earlier than the general population, not from their mental illnesses or substance use disorders, but from treatable medical conditions like cardiovascular disease and diabetes. And we know that many of these conditions are caused by modifiable risk factors, including smoking, obesity, the side effects of psychotropic medications, and lack of access to preventative care. The good news is we know how to help. We know how to engage individuals with behavioral health disorders who experience homelessness. Our PATH program is a shining example. It began 23 years ago and is highly successful in conducting outreach and engagement, providing case management, and connecting individuals to much needed health care and other community resources. SAMHSA, through a concerted technical assistance effort, is working with all 500 PATH providers to partner with their local continuums to strengthen the linkage between housing and health in all the states and territories. PATH providers can assist COCs in connecting individuals with mental health and co-occurring substance use disorders to important services and supports. Last year, PATH providers reached out to more than 192,000 individuals who were homeless or at risk of homelessness. They helped connect many of these individuals to the housing and treatment services they need to recover. Another signature SAMHSA initiative is SOAR, which is the SSI, SSDI Outreach, Access, and Recovery. The SOAR initiative seeks to increase access to SSI and SSDI for people who are homeless or at risk for homelessness by training providers in how to improve the quality of applications for these federal support programs. Social Security benefits provide access to income, housing, health, treatment, and other supportive services. Since 2006, SOAR has assisted more than 29,000 people experiencing homelessness with their applications. Of these, 65% were approved upon initial application, compared to an estimated approval rate of only 10 to 15% for people who did not receive assistance. In 2013 alone, SSI and SSDI for individuals served by SOAR brought an estimated $188 million into states and localities. In our discretionary grant portfolio, we currently have two grant programs programs to help states and local communities strengthen and expand treatment services for persons experiencing homelessness who have substance use disorders, mental illness, or core occurring disorders. The cooperative agreements to benefit homeless individuals for states or CABI states and grants for the benefit of homeless individual services in supportive housing or the GBHI SSH program help to ensure that individuals who experience chronic homelessness receive access to permanent supportive housing, treatment, and recovery supports through mainstream funding sources. These grant programs also support systems change at the state and local levels, an important component in the development of partnerships with HUD grantees, 
Medicaid agencies, FQHCs, the Veterans Administration, and mainstream programs such as Medicaid. SAMHSA is a small agency, and we understand that no one agency can provide all the services that are needed for a person's recovery and housing. We need our partners, and we require our grantees to develop partnerships by creating consortiums where agencies coordinate to address important issues related to housing and health care. For individuals with behavioral health and comorbid physical health conditions, we know that permanent supportive housing and evidence-based recovery focused services are helping people live longer, healthier, more productive lives, and they deserve nothing less. The last initiative that I will mention is our Homeless and Housing Resource Network that offers training, technical assistance, toolkits, publications, and a wealth of other resources to the field. Every month we offer virtual learning classrooms and workshops to help providers build knowledge and skills on numerous health and housing related subjects. We offer webinars open to the public on conducting effective outreach and linking people to health insurance, among other topics. I encourage you to take advantage of what we offer on the HHRN website at www.homeless.samhsa.gov. Jennifer? Great, Jamie. Thank you so much. SAMHSA has been such an incredible partner to HUD and the people who have housing programs to help this population. I really appreciate your being here. Thank you. So we're going to take a break and bring in our other panelists. I'm glad to be back with Donna Cohen-Ross and Emily Rosenoff. Donna is with the Center for Medicaid and CHIP Services, and Emily's at the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation, both at HHS. Donna, you work on uh, Medicaid enrollment issues. Great to have you here. Great. Thanks so much, Jennifer. And I'm just really pleased to be here to join my other federal colleagues in talking about this really important issue. Uh, we've been hearing a lot about the Medicaid program, so I wanted to take just a couple of minutes to say a little bit more about Medicaid itself and what's happened over uh, the past year. Um, as I think you, uh, you can see and I think folks know, we've had a big increase in Medicaid enrollment over the past year. We have more than 9 million new enrollees so far. And I think it's really important for folks to think about two things. One is, um, at the top of the slide that you're seeing now, enrollment for Medicaid and CHIP is always open. Uh, we heard earlier that we're right now in the middle of the open enrollment period for the federal um, and state marketplaces, and that is a very important period of time to enroll in health coverage. But for people who are eligible for Medicaid and CHIP, they can, they can apply at any time, they can enroll at any time. And so uh, this short period of open enrollment uh, is uh, really not a constraint for them, and that's a super important thing for folks to realize. Um, and and the second thing, related to the, the 9 million new enrollees, they are largely newly eligible people, but not only newly eligible people. We um, often see what we call the welcome mat effect, and that is when we have so much conversation about enrollment possibilities and new chances to get health insurance, we open that door, we have the welcome mat out, and what happens? People walk through the door. People who were eligible before their states may have expanded uh, come in and apply and get enrolled in well as well. And so that 9 million number includes newly eligible people and people who were eligible previously. Um, one of the things that we um, are asked very often is whether that new enrollment is only in states that have expanded Medicaid. And, and, and as I've just said, um, it's primarily in those areas, but not exclusively. And I wanted to share for folks um, this map of the 27 states in the District of Columbia who have uh, the states which have already expanded Medicaid, and there are conversations happening um, all the time in terms of uh, states that, that um, haven't, uh, aren't the green states on the map right now that uh, are in the process of uh, thinking about how they may go forward with the Medicaid expansion. And that is tremendously helpful because that gives new opportunities to people who may not have had those opportunities before. And I want to take a moment to talk about who those people are 
who weren't eligible for Medicaid in the past but may be eligible now um, in a state that has expanded coverage. So we're talking about parents of the children states now cover. Um, many of those parents uh, are eligible for the first time. We're talking about parents of children who've um, grown and have left home. Those, uh, those individuals might be eligible now where they were not in the past. Um, women that states cover while they're pregnant may not, um, may not uh, realize that now they, they can be, um, uh, continue to be eligible. Um, older people, but people who are uh, still too young for Medicare, uh, people, younger people who are starting um, out on their own, and individuals who are not yet um, in, uh, who are not in poor enough health to qualify based on, on disability. So there are lots of people who are now eligible for Medicaid who were not eligible in the past in states that have expanded Medicaid. And again, it's important for those folks to know that they can apply and if they're eligible, get enrolled at any time. Um, the other piece that's really important that hopefully uh, folks who are listening in and, and, and watching are familiar with is that the application process has been made much simpler. There's a single streamlined application that works for Medicaid, for CHIP, for coverage to the health insurance marketplace. Uh, our eligibility rules are standard, standardized across all of those health coverage programs. We have an electronic verification process, which makes it uh, a much more modernized system. We are relying less on paper verification, although sometimes we do need to uh, go back to paper verification for some folks. Um, and we also have a modernized renewal process. And I'm going to say a little bit more about that um, in just a moment. But we want to get people enrolled, and then we want them to stay enrolled for as long as they qualify. We want people to have that continuity of care that is so important. Um, uh, so there are some challenges still uh, with enrollment, but also some new opportunities. And I think um, what many people who are listening in today and watching are uh, very concerned about are challenges related to helping people experiencing homelessness apply for coverage. Um, we want people to know that while they need to attest to being the resident of the state where they're applying, they don't need to have a permanent address. Um, this is why it's extremely important to have that one-to-one -one assistance with the application. Um, there are other folks who, um, again, as I said earlier, may be eligible for the first time. And one group that I I didn't mention may be a group that people um, are very concerned about. And those are the young people who are former foster care youth who, um, uh, in the past, uh, ended the possibility for Medicaid coverage when they aged out of foster care, but now can be covered up until age 26. And that's a really important, um, a very vulnerable group, vulnerable group of young people who have a new opportunity to get um, to get health coverage. Um, the increase in coverage is um, contributing to improved access to care and a broader array, array of health services. I think we heard from previous speakers what some of those services are that are so um, critically important. Patients can get uh, services that they couldn't ordinarily get um, uh, in, in the uh, facilities where they're getting coverage because those facilities may not have been able to offer that broader array of services. So having Medicaid coverage is good for patients, but it's also good for the providers and for the infrastructure and ability to offer better care. And of course, as we heard uh, a, a few moments ago, and I think we always need to keep at the top of our mind, when folks have health coverage and can get better care and, more, and the services that they need, they have a much better chance of of uh, uh, going back to work, staying employed, and of course that translates into more opportunities for more stable housing. And so it's that continuum that you're all uh, very much focused on, um, and we know that health coverage and Medicaid in particular for uh, this population is at the core of that um, uh, advancement. Great. Donna, thank you so much, and thanks for the work that you and your colleagues are doing on this issue. Nine million more Americans with Medicaid, and especially thank you for pointing out the opportunities for foster youth. 
Next, we're going to turn to Emily Rosenoff at the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation at HHS. Emily, you know uh, how thrilled I am with these two new publications that you recently put out there. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Jennifer. As mentioned earlier, my office at HHS, the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation, recently released two documents examining the ways that Medicaid can cover services in permanent supportive housing. The first document, Medicaid and Permanent Supportive Housing, Emerging Practices from the Field, explores innovative practices currently underway. Researchers conducted case studies in six communities, including Washington, D.C., Los Angeles County, California, Hennepin County, Minnesota, the state of Connecticut, New Orleans, Louisiana, and Chicago, Illinois. The second document, a primer on using Medicaid for people experiencing homelessness and tenants of permanent supportive housing, serves as a guide for the various options states can use through their Medicaid program to cover services within permanent supportive housing models. The reports focus on chronic homelessness, but the information can be applied to all Medicaid beneficiaries. Medicaid is a program which is jointly administered by the federal government and the states. There are certain rules all states must follow, but each state has quite a bit of flexibility in designing their Medicaid program to meet their own state needs. While Medicaid cannot pay for housing expenses, it can cover health and supportive services and can cover many of the services in permanent supportive housing. For COC clients, this can mean health care, mental health care, and supportive services if eligible. As Donna outlined, while historically it has often been difficult for individuals experiencing homelessness to be eligible for Medicaid, the Affordable Care Act now makes it easier. In states that choose to expand their Medicaid program, nearly all individuals under 133% of the federal poverty level will be able to enroll in Medicaid. In states that have not yet expanded their Medicaid program, there are other changes to Medicaid. For example, a streamlined enrollment process that will help individuals access Medicaid for those who are eligible, or new options for covering supportive services or for coordinating care. While the audience for these reports is state Medicaid staff and officials, COCs can use these documents to gain a greater understanding of the nuances of the Medicaid program. There are lessons here both for COCs in Medicaid expansion states and for those in non-expansion states. Both the, the documents discuss the potential role of federally qualified health centers that Senji mentioned, or FQHCs, in delivering permanent supportive housing services for cover, covered by Medicaid. For COCs, if they are not already partnered with a health center, a good first step is to reach out to local health centers. Another option is to work with healthcare navigators. And as Donna mentioned, unlike private health insurance plans, Medicaid has no open enrollment period. Individuals can enroll at any time. For COCs in California, there is a very helpful document online for housing and homelessness providers called Let's Get Everyone Covered. It details how housing providers can connect clients to health programs and tips for helping them with the enrollment process. To summarize, for COCs, the role of Medicaid will depend in large part to the choices a state makes to their, with their Medicaid program. Do they cover particular supportive services? What are their eligibility requirements? Even in states that are not expanding their Medicaid program under the Affordable Care Act, there are still a number of ways they can cover services for Medicaid beneficiaries experiencing homelessness. We hope that with these new reports, COCs will have a greater understanding of the potential for Medicaid and a greater understanding of this very complex program. We're planning to follow up these reports with additional technical assistance for states and potentially providers. As COC clients increasingly become Medicaid beneficiaries, it should become easier to provide services covered by Medicaid. We also hope to be able to develop more outreach and enrollment documents. Thanks so much. Hey, Emily, that's fantastic. You know, I mean, it really is the case that state Medicaid programs can pay for a lot more to help people experiencing homelessness than they do now. So I think that these documents are going to be really important resources, not just for uh, the homeless providers, but also for the state Medicaid programs themselves. Mm -hmm. So let's take a break while we bring everybody back to the table for some conversation. And thanks for joining Emily and Donna and me here. Um, I wanted to start, Donna, with just a specific question for you. You were talking about enrollment work specifically to help people experiencing homelessness take advantage of the fact that it's open enrollment for Medicaid all the time. Can you talk about a couple specific strategies that are happening around the country that you'd like other people to know about? Um, sure. Thanks, Jennifer, for that question. I think there's just some 
sort of broad principles. Um, and I would just mention that through um, our Connecting Kids to Coverage campaign, we have outreach grantees in uh, about 40 communities around the country. And so we're giving them the same kind of uh, focus as well. And so um, partnership, um, and I think we've tried to uh, model that uh, with this, with this uh, panel, but also um, helping our grantees understand that there are partners in their communities that can help them uh, connect with people who need help with that application. As I said earlier, that one-to-one -one application assistance is so crucial. Um, what we've heard is that um, the community partners that, uh, uh, that they connect with are really important. So certainly, um, when it comes to families and kids, um, uh, uh, Head Start programs, uh, community meal programs, other kinds of um, emergency assistance programs are very important partners. And we're also hearing that um, for a lot of people, particularly people who haven't had health coverage in the past, the concept of health coverage is a new idea. And so talking to people about what their needs are and focusing on particular services is a really great way to start that conversation. So for a lot of people, talking about the opportunity to get help with, for example, uh, uh, dental care, oral health care, is a, it's, a, it's a conversation starter and it's a way to let people know that there is an opportunity through Medicaid and CHIP to get those services covered, to get those services for many people at no charge, um, to make sure that they know they, um, with Medicaid, um, they won't get a bill at the other end, um, to focus on the things that people are particularly worried and concerned about. Those are just some really basic principles along with um, uh, providing that one-to-one -one assistance. The one thing I did want to point out is that we do have some outreach materials that are available to um, anyone who wants to use them. And we do have um, a link to those materials. They're basic Medicaid fact sheets. Um, we have a set that is um, uh, uh, focused on states that have expanded Medicaid coverage, um, as well as a set for states that haven't expanded, so they're slightly different in the message. We also have a special uh, group of materials that are um, that are uh, focused on American Indian and Alaska Native communities because there are some special things we want them to know about particular protections that they have when they are um, enrolling in Medicaid and CHIP. Um, this is just one example of what the materials look like, but there are lots of different images that people can look at. We will, um, when you click on that link on Medicaid.gov, it'll also tell you about um, a service that we provide where we'll customize those materials for you. Um, we can put your logo on there. We can uh, customize it based on the state that you're in. And so we are hoping that folks will find these materials useful. Um, we also have a whole set of materials focused just on children um, at insurekidsnow.gov. So we are really hoping that the message gets out there one-to-one -one with people, but also in written materials that may be um, helpful and may speak to people um, no matter uh, where they are and what their, their um, health care concerns are. And what are you hearing from your um, homeless assistants and HIV providers in terms of their experience last year and their planning for enrollment now? What are, uh, what are you hoping and what do you need so that we can be doing the best job that we can getting people enrolled? As I mentioned, I, you know, we, we know that our continuums and our HAPA grantees are not as connected to, to these systems as we would like for them to be. Uh, we asked some questions in our last continuum of care application, and the responses that we got really helped us uh, form the technical assistance initiative that we're talking about today because we really saw that disconnect and we thought that folks were going to be missing this opportunity that's out there. And so I have four things that I think folks should be doing out there uh, in, in the community. And the first is to please, please use the tools that HHS has put out. They are incredibly helpful and will help our communities and our grantees get educated about what's available, whether they're an expansion state or a non-expansion state. The second thing that I would say is something that folks hear me talk about a lot, and that is using their data. We really want to see our communities use their data to make the to make the argument that these systems should be connected, make the argument to your political leaders, make the argument uh, to the folks who uh, have 
control over the resources that we're talking about at the state or local levels. There are states that Richard mentioned a few of them that are doing some really interesting work around this and they're being successful in making the case for, for uh, getting the resources that they need in the homeless services system. Uh, the third I would say is to use your local officials, whether it's through your local interagency council or state interagency council, uh, to help connect these uh, systems together. And then fourth, I would say use the resources that we're putting on the table through this technical assistance initiative to help uh, the community really come up with a plan and understand what steps they need to take to maximize the resources, both from HHS and from HUD. Right. You know, I mean, enrollment is so important, but after people get enrolled, the next step is really about getting access to the types of assistance that can help people transition from homelessness into stable housing. So, so Emily, um, you have these great publications out there, but can you just kind of simplify uh, for us here today? What are the limits of, of, of Medicaid in terms of what it can and cannot do as it relates to people, uh, in particular people who are operating permanent supportive housing? Yeah. Well, the first and most obvious is that Medicaid cannot pay for room and board. So we, no matter how much Medicaid is in your state or in your, progr or in your program, that's a big barrier. And obviously, that's where we partner with HUD and we partner with our housing providers. Um, and then beyond that, it really, uh, there are some things that every state will cover. And then there are other th things that um, a state will decide to offer. So some of the minimum essential health benefits that every Medicaid beneficiary will have access to are some of the typical things like hospitalization, physician visits. Um, but also as part of this new Medicaid expansion, they will have a set of essential health benefits including mental health and substance use services, uh, rehabilitation and habilitative services, um, and some of those types of things. Now, for all these services, an uh, individual still has to meet medical necessity criteria. So even if a state is very, um, uh, has a state plan that includes supportive services for uh, permanent supportive housing, set, uh, housing settings, um, an individual still might have to meet that medical necessity in order to qualify for those services. Yeah, I'm really struck by uh, uh, the substance use services being an essential um, health benefit because historically a lot of people who had a primary disability of substance use, never even got to Medicaid. Right. And now we're talking about Medicaid being based on income as opposed to being based on what type of disability you have, um, at least in those Medicaid expansion states. So that's, that's a, really big, a really big deal here. Um, so we're really talking about putting together pieces um, that weren't always put together well in the past, um, getting more people enrolled in Medicaid but also changing the way that states design their Medicaid program so that they can provide meaningful assistance. Um, and when you think about the types of partnerships or, or what is the real challenge for homeless assistance providers here as uh, the world has changed through the implementation of the Affordable Care Act? So I think for us as a homeless services community, it's, it's been a difficult transition to really try and give up some of the funding that we've, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, $437 million of the Continuum of Care program funds are still going towards services. And we've actually been incentivizing folks to, to get their services through other mainstream resources for a number of years. But the incentives, the incentives weren't that strong and the services weren't all there yet. And what I see now is that we are at sort of a crossroads. We have an opportunity that is in front of us that we haven't had before. Um, and it's also hard for us, I think, to really get to the point where we understand that we can't solve homelessness with only the homeless services programs. That even though we run a $2 billion uh, program out of out of the SNAPS office, that's still not going to be enough to, to end homelessness, and it's certainly not enough at the local level. Because these funds are so tight, uh, our communities are really having to plan and understand resources in a way that they've never had to before, and this technical assistance initiative is going to help them get there, and the resources from our federal partners are going to help them get there. I think that's the biggest barrier we see right now. Yeah, it strikes me that for people experiencing homelessness, the health care system has not worked that well for them. That's right. And that the way that they got access to health care was either through a health care for the homeless program or by going to the emergency, emergency room. room. So uh, Donna, uh, Emily, there are other new tools available here to make 
I mean, this isn't just about saying, well, the healthcare system wasn't working that well for you. Now more of you can use the system that doesn't work. Instead, this is really about trying to figure out how to make the system provide better care and get better outcomes for people who historically haven't had that. Right, that's right. There are a lot of other service delivery reform opportunities for states or uh, local health care providers that really um, we hope that people take advantage of really to serve people with uh, multiple chronic conditions or other high needs, substance use disorder or things like that to better coordinate care and make sure that they don't fall through the cracks as you just said. So, I would just pick up on what sort of the premise of your question, which, um, you know, embedded in that was, you know, people didn't get what they needed out of the healthcare um, system. And I would just um, reflect on the fact that with more people having insurance and um, enabling providers to uh, to bill for the, the services that they provide, what we're hearing is that not, is not only helpful to patients who have uh, Access to a broader range of services, but um, healthcare providers and healthcare facilities now have an opportunity to offer um, more uh, different kinds of care and things that they couldn't offer in the past. So, by virtue of having insurance, you're again um, helping the patient, but you're also helping the facility and also the whole community because more services can be offered through those communities if people have that insurance. So um, hopefully that is something that will help address um, that, the crux of that problem. And, and I think that there's really systems change happening on both sides of this equation that our communities are ready for and that we just have to help them through TA or through um, education to, to access those, those ways that systems are changing. I think that's right. I mean, it seems like if through expanding insurance and if through new incentives to the healthcare system to do right by people, even people who have been disconnected in the past, this is an enormous opportunity to give the types of care to get the types of outcomes um, that we have all cared about throughout this work. I want to thank the three of you so much for making time for us this afternoon. I want to invite back our other panelists for a little bit more conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad to be rejoined by Jamie Marshall, Seiji Hayashi, and Richard Cho. Uh, thanks for coming back to talk a little bit more about these important issues. Seiji, I was really struck. Um, some of the homeless assistance providers who work in more remote rural areas m maybe aren't, they don't have access to big community things that are happening in cities. Uh, what's your advice for our smaller rural homeless providers? Sure. Um, so I want to just start off by saying that HRSA has invested over $200 million in outreach and enrollment, which uh, then the health centers have hired more than 16,000 outreach and enrollment assisters. And that translates into about 7 million people having been assisted for enrollment for health insurance across the United States. So that's sort of the national uh, snapshot. And 40% of health centers, I mentioned earlier that there are 1,300 organizations, uh, health center organizations, 40% serve rural areas. So, um, you know, there are many health centers that serve rural areas, and most of these, the vast majority, have outreach and enrollment assisters. So, um, you know, my suggestion for especially the rural as well as the urban is that find a health center nearby and almost always they will have an assister there. So one of the first things, um, if you don't know who the health centers are in your community, you should go to find a health center. Find a health center is an application um, uh, on the website where you can just search HRSA, find a health center, and type in your address or zip code, and you'll see the, um, within a certain radius the health centers in your community. If you have a hard time understanding who to partner with, um, all states have primary care associations where you can reach out to, and they can um, help you navigate which health centers uh, specifically serve the communities that you're interested in, whether it's homeless or public housing. But it seems like uh, homeless service providers should know who their local health centers are anyways, because that's going to be a good referral for care uh, for people that they're seeing. But sure. this is a great opportunity to solidify those relationships. Jamie, let me turn to Can you. Can I say oh, one sure. more thing? 
Um, one of the most important things about the Sisters in Health Centers, we, um, they are not specific to health center patients. They actually are uh, required to serve all people in the community. So don't um, be shy about reaching out to the health centers. They are there to help the community, not just patients of the health center. So the assisters can help anybody, even if you're not a patient at that yes. clinic, get signed up for Medicaid yes. or, or other health insurance. Yes. Great, thank you. Jamie, it just makes me wonder, you have uh, grantees uh, providing homeless services through SAMHSA. Um, are there specific uh, messages that you would want to send in terms of what their role is around making these connections and enrolling people? Absolutely, Jennifer. Um, helping educate individuals with beh behavioral health conditions about their rights and responsibilities is, is key for all of our providers um, to be doing. And as well, um, using peer specialists and health navigators to work with individuals and, and really expand the, the workforce um, is, is another key message that we like to, um, to really promote. Uh, Seiji, coming back to you one more time, and it seems to me that some of the stories that I've heard from around the country, you've got health care for the homeless providers. These are people that work in shelters. They do street outreach. But they also, as health centers or as, as health care providers, um, are connected to Medicaid and, and, and doing that enrollment work. Do you want to say anything about the unique work that health care for the homeless providers are doing around enrollment? Sure. I think that healthcare for the homeless providers understand the unique needs of the homeless population. So not only are they providing comprehensive primary care, but tailored to the needs of the community. And as you know, many of us mentioned about substance abuse and mental illness uh, support and uh, services, um, as well as, you know, as you said, going out to where the um, patients are or the community uh, resides, whether it's on the street, in the shelters, under bridges, you know, and other places where um, uh, the community uh, receives services. So many of the healthcare for the homeless providers will partner with other social services, housing, um, and other uh, social service providers uh, in order to do the outreach. You know, Richard, let me, uh, let me step back a little bit from these specific enrollments and partnerships, and let's just talk for a moment about what's possible. Talked a little bit with the last panel about how um, Everything doesn't quite add up yet. There's, uh, the healthcare system historically hasn't worked for people experiencing homelessness. Um, now more people have an opportunity to be insured and to be connected to care. But really, what do you think are the key elements of transforming this system so that it works better for people? I'm really glad you raised that question, Jennifer. I think we've talked a lot here today about Medicaid enrollment and about increasing coverage. And that's really, I think, just the first step uh, in what health reform really is about. I think the other step is really about how health reform is really uh, kind of changing the game in terms of um, realigning um, and better aligning what health care means with really what matters for health. Uh, and as we know, for people with really complex and chronic health conditions, uh, often what really matters for health is um, things like housing, uh, is things like having a case manager or somebody who they can talk to. Uh, and we're starting to see now uh, where states are really looking for solutions that can um, really uh, approach the delivery of healthcare differently for people with complex and chronic health conditions, and um, that includes people experiencing homelessness, and where they're really um, hungry for solutions that work and have show, show evidence that are kind of outside the box, um, things outside of uh, what we tr typically and traditionally think of as uh, medical care. Um, they're really looking at solutions that um, address some of the social needs that people have. Uh, and as they do that, they're, um, I think, really compelled by some of the evidence that we have around permanent supportive housing. Uh, and so you see a lot of states now looking at reaching out to um, people who work in the housing and the homelessness field to say, what can we learn about supportive housing that we can apply uh, to become a Medicaid strategy and health care strategy more broadly? I'm struck by the fact that the mantra of health reform is better care, better health, lower costs. Sometimes it seems like in the homelessness space, we've focused a lot on the side of the argument that's about lowering costs. But the beautiful thing about health reform is that it begins with better care, and that better care is going to lead to better health for people, and then the systems piece uh, in addition. I, um, there are some specific opportunities right now uh, because you have people mobilized around the open enrollment period. And um, I know that we wanted to make sure that we were really clear on the fact that it's always, uh, it's always open enrollment period for people who are on Medicaid. It doesn't end on any given date. You can always sign up. But I'm just wondering if uh, now when we kind of have providers' attention, 
if there's any final thoughts that any of you want to provide to, uh, to our listeners today in terms of the work that they can do to advance this cause. I, mean, I, I would say that over the last few years, there's been a really remarkable increase in the vocabulary of people who work on the effort to end homelessness and people who work in housing about, about health care. They're now learning to speak the language of Medicaid and speak the language of health care. And I think the more we can have people who work in the homelessness space and housing space become confident and um, build the literacy so they can actually speak to people in the healthcare system and then reach across and say that we have common goals and that we have a way to work together to pair our resources with one another um, to achieve those common goals. Seiji? Yeah, I think one of the most important pieces that has been coming up within the healthcare arena is the importance of the social determinants of health, such as housing. And that, you know, we as physicians, as providers, and as healthcare um, clinics, we can do so much to improve the health. If we can't uh, um, impact the social determinants, we, we really can't improve the overall health. And that's why partnerships like this, you know, even within HHS as well as, you know, throughout the federal government, I think this is really the way to, you know, improve the health of the entire community. And I'd like to add, add uh, integrating the, the primary care and the behavioral health services is something that, you know, we can't do enough of to get that, so people do not have to go to separate places to get the care that they need. Well said. Well, I want to thank you all for joining us here today, and I want to thank you so much for watching this important webinar on connecting people who are recipients of HOPWA or HUD homeless assistance to health insurance, Medicaid, and quality health care. Uh, if you'd like more information, there's a link here to joining our listserv. There's also an opportunity for you to request an action planning event in your community by following the instructions on the screen. Again, I'm Jennifer Ho at HUD. Thank you so much for all that you're doing to improve the health of the most vulnerable Americans, and thanks for watching this webinar.